Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone, who's um, messaging us to say where you're from. It's lovely to see, um, to see that. Thank you so much for joining everyone um, to this Global Health Network Research in Focus lecture. Today we're, we're broadcasting in collaboration with Global Health Economics. Um, my name's Helena Wilcox and I'm from the Global Health Network. And today I'm really delighted to be joined by Paul Revel, Senior Research Fellow and TLO Programme Director at the Centre for Health Economics at the University of York. We're delighted to have Paul uh, chairing today's session and chairing the Q&A. We also have Edward Kateka, Director of Programmes at the East, Central and Southern Africa Health Community. And finally, Pakwan Jatwia, Economist at the Ministry of Health and Population in Malawi. Today, we're focusing on health benefits packages for universal health coverage, and the panel will be discussing the latest theory and health benefits package design and provide insights into how this is currently being applied in Malawi. This lecture today helps launch the new Global Health Economics Hub on the Global Health Network, an open access community of practice to support health economics research capability and its use within policy in low and middle income country settings. This hub represents a collaboration between Tanzi Laon's Health for All research programme and the East, Central and Southern Africa health community. Developed, this is developed for anyone interested in the field of health economics and offers a platform for sharing knowledge, collaboration, engagement and training through dedicated discussion forums, as well as access to resources for career development. Before I hand over to our panel today, I've just got a couple of points of housekeeping. Um, please note that this lecture is being recorded. The, the recording will be available later this week on hub.tghn.org forward slash in hyphen focus. We'll post all of these details in the chat for you so you can follow those links. So please do share it with your colleagues and, and visit and share your thoughts. Um, secondly, to ask your questions of the panel, we'll take a question session at the end, kindly chaired by Paul. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions. And if you have any technical difficulties, please also use that Q&A function there. You can follow the Global Health Network and Tanzi Laons on Twitter. And so please do tweet us and I'll sort of close the housekeeping and introductions and have the pleasure of handing over to Edward who will be our first speaker for today. We'll just get that presentation up for you. Hello everyone. And welcome to the webinar on health benefits packages for universal health coverage, specifically looking at how research can inform policy and practice. In this webinar, we will also be launching the Global Health Economics Hub, a site hosted on the Global Health Network, which will provide an open access training platform for health economics researchers, students, and professionals. The hub was primarily developed to support a recently established health economics community of practice for the East, Central and Southern African health community. However, given that it is an open access platform, it will not only be utilized by the community of practice in East, Central and Southern Africa, but will also facilitate online engagement between professionals in this region and the global health economics community. My name is Edward Kataika, and I am Director of Programs at the East, Central, and Southern Africa Health Community, HCI-HC. Let me also introduce two colleagues who constitute the panel with me in the webinar. We have Mr. Paul Revo, who is a Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Health Economics, University of York in the UK. Paul is also Director of the Translawance Program and Translawance means health for all. I'll say a little more about this program in my presentation shortly. We also have Ms. Papanja Tweya. She is an economist in the Ministry of Health in Malawi. Next slide. So we have three presentations in the webinar. I will first introduce the Global Health Economics Hub, which we are launching in this webinar. This will be followed by a presentation by Paul, who will give an overview of the research that has been conducted recently on health benefits packages. 
and then Papanja will present the case study of Malawi on the adoption of a health benefits package and the revision of the resource allocation formula in the country. After these presentations, we will have a question and answer session which will take us to the end of the webinar. So with that introduction, I will now move on to introduce the Global Health Economics Hub. The Global Health Economics Hub is established to support health economics research capability and its use within policy in low-income countries. Through the Hub, we aim to help our community members, including those coming from backgrounds other than economics, to understand the field of health economics. We will thus use it to disseminate teaching materials in health economics, but also promote health economics as a discipline for informing policy decisions. And we believe that in low-income countries, there is still plenty of room for health economics to make its contribution in informing policy. The Hub will support health economists in their career development and keep them up to date with recent developments in the health economics field. On the right hand side of the slide is an image of the home page of this hub and beneath it is the web link for the site. Next slide. Who are the target users? We envisage that the platform will provide useful resources to researchers in health economics. Medical or healthcare professionals, who in most cases do not have any training in economics, will be able to gain an understanding of health economics through the hub. Same with policymakers, those whose background is not economics or related fields. Professional health economists and students are also our key target users. The main features, what will the platform contain? There will be pages where educational and training materials on health economics will be posted. The hub will also facilitate interaction among the users. It will have a discussion forum where users will interact and exchange knowledge and experiences on issues relating to health benefits packages. Through the platform, we will also be able to organize and stream webinars on various health economics topics. Next slide. The idea of establishing the Global Health Economics Hub came about during interactions with the Health Economics Community of Practice, which EXA established for its member states about a year ago in collaboration with the Translaunce program. Members of the community of practice expressed need for support in strengthening the health economics capacity for the region in various ways. This platform was suggested as one of the ways of supporting the local health economics community in the region. Hence, EXA in collaboration with the Translaunce program worked towards the establishment of the hub. Next slide. A little more information about the two collaborators, the Tanzilawense Health for All program. This is a four-year research program led by the Center for Health Economics, University of York, and consists of nine research collaborators in five countries. It is funded by the UKRI Global Challenges Research Fund and aims to improve population health and reduce health inequalities in Malawi, Uganda, and the East and Southern Africa region. It aims to achieve this by developing and sustaining high quality research to inform resource allocation decisions and supporting policy environments for the productive use of that research. The program has three objectives, namely to develop economic and epidemiological analysis to help address relevant health challenges in the two focus countries and region to strengthen local policy and research capability in health economics, and to strengthen strong international and regional networks to advance research topics and evidence uptake for improving population health in Malawi. You may wish to visit the program website as displayed at the top right corner of this slide. Next slide. The other collaborator is the EXA Health Community. This is a regional intergovernment organization established to foster cooperation on health among countries in the East and Southern Africa region. It currently has nine member countries. The countries colored in blue on the map 
are the current member states of the health community. EXA, however, collaborates with other countries that are not its member states through various projects or programs. So currently, EXA has presence in 19 African countries, including the 10 colored in orange, which are not its member states. Next slide. As an intergovernment organization, EXA works with member governments, mainly the ministries of health. Its governance structure is also made up of officials from the member governments. We have the Health Ministers Conference as the highest governing body, which defines health policy priorities for the region. It brings together ministers of health from all member countries and convenes once every year to review the region's health situation and provide policy direction on the regional health agenda. We also have an advisory committee, the management board comprising permanent secretaries of ministers of health of the member states, which advises the health ministers on administrative and financial matters of the organization. The director's joint consultative committee, DJCC, is the highest technical body that advises the health ministers on health policy and technical matters. This committee is made up of senior technical officials from ministries of health and from universities and health research institutions of the member states. Through this committee, EXA provides a platform where policymakers interface with researchers in the process of defining the health policy agenda for the region. The committee then makes policy recommendations to the ministers for their consideration and adoption. The Secretariat of XHC coordinates the implementation of policy decisions of the health ministers, but also the convening of various stakeholders in the process of setting the policy agenda for the region. Health needs of the region are identified through the Forum on Best Practices on the one hand, and Program Experts Committees or Communities of Practice on the other. The Forum on Best Practices on Health brings together experts from member states, collaborating partners, and other key stakeholders from the region. In this forum, best practices on how stakeholders address the various health problems faced by countries in the region are shared, including the challenges faced in the process. Relevant research evidence that may contribute to solving the health problems is also shared. The forum then makes recommendations of collective action for dealing with common health challenges in the region. These recommendations are further considered by the DJCC and the health ministers respectively, and ultimately adopted as resolutions of the health ministers. On the other side are the experts committees. These draw membership from senior staff of ministers of health in the respective technical areas and are supported by external experts as identified from time to time. Their purpose initially was to contribute to the identification of health needs of the member states in the respective technical fields and recommending possible solutions. As groups of like-minded technical individuals, expert committees also provide an opportunity for professional development as the members exchange experiences and learn together and from each other. Hence, over time, expert committees have evolved into what we now call communities of practice. And the most recent of these communities of practice is the one on health economics. Next slide. Let me end by giving the rationale and the membership of the community of practice. The rationale for the EXA health economics community of practice was to create a critical mass of experts in health economics in the region and putting in place a mechanism for responding to the needs of member countries in this field. This also serves as a platform for continuous learning and sharing of knowledge among the health economists. The membership of the community of practice is drawn from ministers of health of member countries, ideally the planning departments where economists are normally placed. Membership extends to health economists from universities and research institutions based in member countries. We also bring on board senior level health economists from select collaborating institutions who play an advisory role and function as resource persons to the community of practice. 
let me end there and now invite Paul to give the next talk. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Edward. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about something that really should be central to, to all uh, country healthcare systems around the world. And that's the choice of which interventions are prioritised for funding within the national healthcare system. And this is often listed in, in what's known as a health benefits package. Um, although the listing of interventions may not always be as, as explicit uh, as is contained in the health benefits package. Now, until relatively recently, there was a real paucity of, of, of research uh, on how health benefits packages can be appropriately designed. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, a recent stream of research which both informs the design of health benefits packages, let's call them uh, HBPs, and also their subs subsequent use and the range of other important health system decisions that they can inform uh, and, and shape. So firstly, let's be clear about what is a HBP. So HBP defines the list of publicly provided health services offered within a country's healthcare system. It can be used if financing for healthcare is predominantly tax-based, uh, but often uh, now, as many countries are looking at introducing social health insurance in various forms, the push towards having an explicit EHP is often even firmer due to requirements to, to list uh, the set of entitlements within a social health insurance scheme. So HBPs are constrained by the level of funds available for healthcare delivery. And these constraints upon funds available have a number of implications. Firstly, most obviously, is that not everything that can provide benefits to patients can feasibly be funded uh, out of a constrained budget. And this is true in all settings within the world, but it's particularly true the stark choices have to be particularly made in those countries with the national healthcare budgets, which are which are relatively um, more constrained, particularly low and middle income countries. Also, the choice of a HBP has to be made recognising the complexities both in the financing of healthcare, that funding in many instances comes from a variety of channels, particularly in, in some of the lowest resource healthcare settings, a reliance on overseas uh, development and assistance in many of the cases. And also, a health benefits package needs to be delivered within a system which almost invariably is imperfect. There's constraints within that system in terms of how healthcare can be delivered and constraints and limits of the population in, in accessing healthcare. So although HBP may just be seen as a list, in reality, the design and its use is much more complex than that. So the research which I'm going to discuss here is primarily being based upon collaboration between the Ministry of Health in Malawi, and you'll hear Pakwanja Twia speak next about the policy dimensions um, of, of HBP formulation in Malawi. Pakwanja is from the Ministry of Health. And also the Tanzilonze program, particularly the Centre for Health Economics in York, uh, where, where I'm based myself. Now the work which has been undertaken has been designed to answer a few key priority questions. So I'll list some of those here. Firstly, which interventions represent the best buys for a healthcare system and therefore should be prioritised for funding? However, I mentioned some of the difficulties and constraints within healthcare systems. So we can't just consider best buys without recognising that some interventions to deliver, uh, are easier to deliver, particularly at scale in rural, hard to reach areas than others. So we need to also recognise that health system is constrained and because budgets are limited, there's also a choice of not just determining which interventions are provided, but also determining to what extent those limited budgets, uh, instead of committing to expanding the list of interventions, are committed to strengthening healthcare systems and particularly the feasibility of intervention delivery in, uh, in, in areas and in parts of a country 
when the health system is relatively weaker. So there's a trade-off to be made between an expanded list and health system strengthening. This work has tried to identify the, how the decisions, how that trade-off can be can, can, can be resolved, and how the list of interventions uh, to be de 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 delivered within existing constraints can be balanced off and traded off against actually limiting the budget for HBP, but instead expanding the budget for health system strengthening. So I mentioned earlier that the funding channels for healthcare delivery are actually quite complex. In almost no cases is that a challenge of having one overall healthcare budget which is allocated across healthcare needs. Instead, in most places, the budget is much more fragmented and particularly in lower income um, country healthcare systems, there can be a high reliance on, on donor funding. So the commitment of donor funding means that in many cases, a HBP needs to reflect what will be provided from external uh, partners, from external do donor funds, as well as what the choice set is uh, for the use of, uh, of nationally, nationally owned and uh, uh, funds. But more than that, the way that a HP is designed and the evidence which is collated and presented in its design can actually show how alternative funding channels can sometimes be detrimental to healthcare delivery. So, for instance, if in a healthcare system such as in the case in Malawi and it's over reliant upon external sources of funds, sometimes those external sources of funds can, yes, be contributing to commodities or vertical healthcare delivery. Well, what a health benefits package, which looks in a more holistic sense across all healthcare needs, can show is that in some cases it would be better if donor resources were committed to where there's a relatively relative underfunding um, of, of, um, of, of vital interventions, particularly, for instance, in child health or maternal health. Therefore, the design of a health benefits package can also help to hold funders accountable and change the balance of financing so it's more and better aligned uh, with overall needs across, across the whole country. Further, the choice of healthcare, in particular I described health benefits packages as determining best buys, calls into question how best buys can be determined. Usually a health benefits package is determined based upon the health um, that different interventions could generate. And the preferred option in many ways is to let's assume that the health of different individuals represented by interventions ability to reduce an individual's burden of disease uh, from disease within the country is treated equally. So in some ways we could in the first instance, design a health benefits package, assuming a dally is a dally is a dally, whoever incurs that dally. However, that might not be the position of the national government or, or the values that the population holds most dear. We may instead wish to design a health benefits package which shows that perhaps greater weight should be given to the health of the least privileged and the least well off. So health benefit packages can also be designed with concern for equity of healthcare provision, reflecting that the distribution of health across a population is not, is not equal. Uh, so I highlight a reference here which has done this from Malawi. Okay, so I mentioned that health benefits packages really um, can be used for much more than stipulating the interventions which are receiving funding. And two important areas which um, can be used subsequently once a health benefits package is, has been determined is the decision as to how the national healthcare budget is allocated across different geographical units. And particularly, this is in the form of the geographical resource allocation formula. So often in the past, resource allocation formulas have been determined based upon proxies of, of, of need. So the, um, the number of individuals within a district, the age profile, 
um, the uh, incidence or prevalence of various diseases. However, what a health benefits package gives us is the return from health spending on different sets of interventions. Therefore, if we can use health benefits packages as being key to, and underlying choices as to the geographical distribution of funds, we can help move more in the direction where that geographical distribution of funds is more likely to lead to greater health across the population. So health benefits packages can also inform national healthcare budget allocation across uh, local, uh, local units. Further, there's many, many millions are spent each year on, on research for healthcare in, especially in low and middle income countries, for instance. However, often that research which is funded is detached from the decisions as to how healthcare would be provided on a wider scale to the population. I've shown on the last slide references which have contributed to the design of health benefits packages. However, evidence underlying the design of health benefits packages is invariably uncertain. Therefore, this creates an opportunity for that uncertainty and the consequences of that uncertainty to help guide the prioritisation of research such that research, once delivered, is more likely to have an effect on what is provided in terms of healthcare delivery. So there is a real opportunity to use health benefits packages and uncertainty around them to highlight which forms of research are likely to be most beneficial and greatest value for money. Okay, you can see hopefully that some of the decisions and uses of HBPs uh, actually open the door to a really rich set of um, important policy relevant questions. And this is uh, a field, a research field, which is really uh, fair to enter in, and there's many avenues still to explore within this field. So I just want to touch finally in this slide on some of the directions for future research. So developing a health benefits package or even a resource allocation formula is a contribution that analysis, analysis, analysis can make to health policy formulation, but it's only really starting point, it only represents effectively lists. Some of the biggest challenges relate to how to move from a list to implementation. And it raises questions such as how can budgeting, financing systems, accounting systems be designed so it better ensures that finances that work their way through a healthcare system are likely to match uh, priorities as uh, determined by health benefits packages. Um, also, M&E systems can also be designed in a way which monitors appropriately the implementation or not of a health benefits package. And finally, the funding and financing systems, the purchasing systems, which all healthcare systems rely on, can also be designed in ways which emphasise and are more likely to lead to those interventions which have been shown to be greatest value uh, through evidence used to design health benefits packages actually been funded and pr been prioritised by, by providers. So I highlight a few references at the bottom here uh, which show how these additional rich set of questions uh, have started to be addressed and, and really I, I emphasise that this is just a beginning of uh, this research, um, stream of research you're moving from HPPs as lists um, to uh, real actions to send implementation and use of healthcare. It's really just beginning. Before I end, I want to highlight that some of the references and the literature and the approaches that I've touched upon within this presentation have been developed in the context of limited data availability um, using international estimates of cost effectiveness and routine data systems within countries. However, there's a possibility of doing much more than that, given the importance of HPPs um, for how a health system functions and the health uh, which a population ultimately um, uh, receives and generates. It's really worthwhile to, to do as much as, as is feasible, as much as possible uh, within this topic. 
And within the Tantalonze programme, I just want to highlight ongoing work, which is uh, modelling health and disease, location-specific intervention effectiveness, and health system constraints. That's the number of healthcare workers, facilities, where they're located and where populations access healthcare in a much more granular level. This is the first time such an approach has been taken, but I think really holds promise to show how better evidence can translate to better health. It's hopefully, hopefully an avenue of research which others um, and other countries, other groups uh, will pursue in, in, in into the future. Uh, however, before I end, I want to um, highlight one point, uh, which is the analysis, um, the research, evidence generation is only beneficial to the extent that it's coupled with, with, with policy formulation. It needs to be an act of research is working hand in hand with, with policymakers. And research is only one aspect of the, uh, of the process. In the next talk by Pakwanji Twia, you'll hear how research such as that which I've touched upon in this talk has been used in practice in the policy process in, in Malawi. So thank you. I'll hand over to Pakwanji. Hello, this is Bogonja Dweya from the Ministry of Health in Malawi. I will be talking around issues of resource allocation, starting with um, the development of the health benefits package in Malawi, as well as the development of resource allocation formula. So I will start uh, by talking about the health benefits package, referring mostly to the paper by Glassman et al. on creating a health benefits package and understanding the necessary processes for that. Now the process will of course begin by setting broad goals and criteria to be followed in the development of the package. And this will of course be standard across uh, most countries and you're looking at broad goals such as equity, efficiency and other political considerations. After this is done, there's a need then to operationalize the general criteria, make it more uh, uh, more specific and more amenable to further analysis, further appraisal, uh, in order to understand what's uh, what what would be included and what would be excluded from the package. Um, so Glassman et al. of course um, uh, propose or that the methods, the appraisal methods that are eventually taken into account should meet four key criteria. The first of which to ensure that it's technically uh, robust and justifiable. That is reflective of the country's social values. It is easy to understand and um, very low cost to implement. After this is done, then there's a need to choose the shape of the health benefits package and select areas for further analysis. And this will look different for different countries. Um, we have one broad package. Some other countries have divided the, the, the health benefits package into different categories. But even within this step, there's a need to then come to a decision on what criteria you're putting in place to understand what goes into the package and what is excluded from the package. And for us, apart from health maximization, we had to look at other criteria that we took into account and um, looking at how the interventions fit along the continuum of care, how we can take into account uh, interventions that are necess not necessarily affordable, but that are uh, funded um, through other sources like the um, donors, and then how the, ser the services within the package complement each other. After this is done, there's a need to then collate existing uh, information and collect new evidence. So uh, through systematic reviews, meta-analysis, uh, uh, the, the country now has an understanding of the information that they have and the gaps become apparent. And you look at how you can collect the new evidence to fill those information gaps and help with, whoever, with the actual appraisals and the budget impact assessment, which is the next step and also helps us to understand how this the implementation of this benefits package fits into the overall resource framework of the country and how what sort of impact the budget, uh, the implementation will have on the budget in the short and medium term. And of course, after this, then there'll be need uh, to then deliberate around the evidence that has been developed and the appraisals and based on, uh, uh, on, on consensus come to an understanding of what recommendations should be made uh, to the policymakers and the decisions that should be made uh, up when those recommendations have been made. And of course, after this is a need to then translate the decisions into resource 
allocation and use. This will, will look different again for different countries. First, it means uh, uh, appropriating the resources in the budgets, uh, changing the structure of the program based budgeting to um, explicitly um, incorporate um, the essential health package. And then I think there's a need to manage and implement the health benefits package uh, to monitor it. And of course, as you're monitoring it, the final step is you review it, you learn, and adjust accordingly as you learn. Uh, um, and not taking the development as an end itself, but as a, as a process uh, that would constantly need to be revised and that policymakers need to learn from and use that to inform decision uh, making uh, going forward. Of course, taking into account that the context has to take in, uh, has to consider other components of the health system, such as the, the donors, the health system, the imperfect healthcare markets, the political institutions, the regime, the rights, technology, wealth, and other uh, contextual issues that are that will be specific to different countries. Now, I think for us, the development of the or the development and design of the health benefits package was built upon research that was undertaken by the Center for the Health Economics at the University of York, and of course at the request of the Malawi Ministry of Health and Population. But what we wanted to do is to culminate in the development of an essential health package that identifies the interventions which maximize health uh, within the Mal Malawian population and within, of course, the existing resources, but also uh, explicitly taking into account op opportunity costs and um, in decision making in order to inform the development of the of the budget. Um, so uh, with that background in the development of a health benefits package, I will then talk about the development of resource allocation formula in trying to then uh, put in place a framework for uh, determining how resources are going to be appropriated across geographic areas. Now, we did have an existing resource allocation formula that was uh, agreed upon and even uh, uh, approved in Parliament, but was never implemented. So we ended up in a situation where we resources are allocated according to historic precedence, which is um, not a very efficient way of allocating resources because if you have an a resource or, or an allocation that is inherently inequitable, you tend to perpetuate it by um, using historic uh, precedence for allocating resources. So in 2019, a new tool was developed and it illustrated four resource allocation formula options. The first one is a crude population allocation where you're putting an amount on each head. Again, not a, an, an efficient way of allocating resources because it, take, it does not take into account the variations in health need across uh, geographic areas. Then I think the second option then uh, try to take this into account by using modality uh, as a proxy for health need and then using that to allocate, uh, to determine the per capita allocation, but going a step further and accounting for or controlling for variations in health and sex, uh, which are key de determinants of health care need. And the third option then looked at the, the the other side of healthcare need and that's the the cost of delivering the package so looking at the numbers of people who who are going to require the services and the cost per service provided to come up with the overall cost of delivering the service and assuming that the service will be fully delivered to everyone who's, who needs the service again uh, not very realistic in the sense that we do have constraints in our health system that do not allow us at this point to be able to deliver the service to everyone who needs it so the fourth option took this into consideration and then and uh, accounted for, for the constraints in healthcare delivery to come up with the cost of delivering the service and then taking this into account in appropriating resources across the districts and this is the the option that we're taking further in implementation uh, um, um, going forward, and of course it will, it will keep on being uh, uh, being revised. So I think I've talked about the costs um, 
and and the methods but i think like what we what, the, what we learned in the previous slide the also the the other steps still apply that you still have to do after you've determined um the process you still have to go back and uh, deliberate on on the proposals you still have to then make recommendations to policy makers and then make decisions and implement and of course learn adjust and implement accordingly so that that has been our experience in malawi in, in the development of a, a health benefits package uh, the essential health package as well as in the development of resource allocation formula and implementation thank you very much okay so thank thank you everyone for your um for following the the the, the presentations and thanks for the questions received uh, please continue to send questions through uh, the chat and Q and A um, bar. So, before we begin to um, to go through the questions in, in, in Q and A, just want to highlight uh, that on the um, Global Health Economics website, there's there's a full course with full course materials available on on health benefits package design and the design of resource allocation formulae. So, you may uh, wish to wish to look uh, through through those. There will also be um, course materials uh, which are continue to be uploaded uh, throughout the the coming year and and, and beyond um, so there's a feedback form on the website and please uh, continue to provide um, uh, feedback as to which uh, as to whether the courses have been valuable and which uh, future courses and material would be would be valuable for you uh, so let's now begin the the q a uh, there were a couple of questions uh, if i could begin for you, Edward, in relation to uh, the role and functioning of, of EXA. Uh, I apologise if, um, if pronunciations for, for names, but there's a question for Lochun, uh, I think. What constitutes the advisory committee for, for EXA? Uh, and also a question uh, as to whether Kenya uh, is, is engaged in, in, in the EXA health community and in what capacity? if you'd like to kick us off Edward in, in response. Yeah, thank you very much Paul. Thank you much for those questions. The advisory committee, like I said, this is our management board. They advised ministers on the administrative and financial matters, but also provide oversight to the secretariat. Composition, these are permanent or principal secretaries from the member states. They sit on a rotational basis, five at a time. So they'll start sitting, rotating based on the, the, the member states, uh, uh, based on uh, you know, the, the alphabetical order of the country. And they also include a financial expert who is a financial advisor to, to the advisory board. So these are just the dealing with administrative matters. Of the, of the organization, that's the advisory committee. Now, K as a member state, yes, let me just confirm that uh, Kenya is a member state of EXA, an active member state, and it does actively participate in all meetings of the, of the governance bodies, starting the ministers all the way down, including the community of Okay, and fortunately, there seems to be a, a, a technical uh, issue. I think Edward's highlighting that, uh, yes, ex um, Kenya is uh, a member state uh, of ex Growth Ministry of Health. Sorry. Ah, sorry, Edward. So, oh, yes, it uh, looks like I was interrupted a bit. Yes, I was talking about Kenya. It's an active member of, of the extra health community. They do participate. And even in the community of practice of, on health economics, we have representation from the Minister of Health Planning Department, I think, and then the other person is from Nairobi University. We also work with Kenya in various projects that Kenya participates in. And perhaps what I can do there for details, I can just provide the EXA website, which provides details of the project that we are implementing in the region and which countries that we are working in. Yeah, so maybe let me stop there. 
Thank you, Edward. Um, so maybe there's another question here, uh, I think probably best for Paquanja. Uh, so this is a question from Christopher. Uh, please, can you elaborate on the role of universities in providing technical assistance uh, and external validation of work carried out and engaged in by Ministry of Health um, planning units? Uh, so Paquanja, I wonder if you could answer that and maybe perhaps draw upon examples of how you work with the academic community in Malawi. Okay, no, thank you very much for that question. Yes, I think there's a big role for universities and the academia to play in around uh, decisions of, um, the discussions of decision making. Um, for us, we've, we work with the College of Medicine here, um, also through the Tanzania Onsip project, I think we also work with the uh, University of York, and they helped us with the uh, technical analysis. And um, I think just apart from that, um, this, there's a need to engage as many stakeholders as possible during the process of coming up with the health benefits package as well as uh, with the resource allocation formula just because at the end of the day you have to make a decision that has been validated and you have consensus around uh, not just within the government but also from the academia as well as other non-government organizations so for us i think the, the academia has had a big role to play in in helping us with analysis and the uh, technical um, um, decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pekwanja. So there are two questions here which maybe I'll uh, answer. One is from Lurchin, which is, do developing countries need to improve health conditions for health benefits packages to play a vital role? And a question from Gabrimiak, which is, how do you see health benefits packages in developing countries in terms of their feasibility? And what does evidence tell us about the status of health benefits package policy implementation in, in countries? What best examples can we, can we highlight and, and, and draw upon? Um, so I think maybe the first thing to highlight is that in, the, in, in many countries, particularly where healthcare budgets are very low, health systems are really weak. Um, so you may question uh, whether a health benefits package should be used and formulated in such a, in, in such a country. And uh, my response to that uh, would be that, yes, there's a need for prioritisation. and There's an even greater need uh, for prioritisation the more that resources are, are constrained. Uh, because if wrong decisions uh, are made, uh, that means some really high value interventions can't be delivered and um, sometimes can't be delivered. Uh, at uh, increasing scale to those who most who most need them. Um, so I think the important thing here is to fit, to recognise that the design of a health benefits package isn't where the set of policy challenges begins and ends, uh, but it needs to be designed uh, recognising uh, weaknesses in, 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 in systems and also highlighting uh, how those systems can be strengthened for uh, greater scale up to all, all, the, all in need uh, within, a, within a country. In terms of highlighting best practices, given that almost all countries have a health benefits package in some form, it's really been remarkable how little literature, uh, both in peer review journals, but also disseminated more widely, uh, that has been produced on, on best, practices, best practices and how to design uh, health benefits packages. Uh, I highlighted a few references in my uh, presentation, uh, other examples of best practices which I could point to is a recent book um, by uh, the Centre for Global Development, uh, which is a manual for designing health be benefits packages and uh, highlights some examples of, of, of how this has been undertaken in countries across the world. And the Equinet group as well also has a series of uh, briefs which uh, highlight examples of best practices in, in health benefits package design. Uh, but uh, this is still uh, uh, a research area where it's, it's really valuable for more research and accumulated um, lessons to be, to be learned as, 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 as we move forward from here. So let me um, take another question here. So there's a question from uh, Christopher, who I think looks like maybe based in Nigeria. Uh, maybe if I could ask you to answer this, Pekwanja, it's what advice would you have for um, a developing a health benefits package in such a large country as Nigeria uh, without the incumbencies of having to work through a whole national uh, bureaucracy. 
Um, so I don't know. I guess the question is whether whether a health benefits package can be um, can be designed at a federal or a more local level, or whether it also needs or always needs to be added at a national level. Yeah, um, thank you very much for that question. Um, I can I can talk to our experience, and hopefully that will also be helpful for you as you are trying to figure out how you can do it in your country. Um, so our our health system is not it's not built or it's not designed like the uh, Nigerian system where you have a federal government that has their own uh, decision-making um, uh, authority. Um, ours, I think the decision-making authority lies mostly at the national level, at least for this kind of policy direction. Uh, what I can say is that I think, um, I think in any government you expect some level of uh, bureaucracy. I think the way we we had for getting around it was to make sure the process is as competitive as possible, just so you make sure that you are incorporating um, um, all aspects of decision making. I, I mentioned before the academia, the Ministry of Health itself, uh, working uh, with non-government organizations as, as well as the civil society. So uh, as you build consensus around improving all these uh, uh, sectors in decision making, it's easier then to, to deal with the bureaucracy because you have um, you're making decisions that are improving um, a lot of um, um, sectors and 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 that makes easier um, that makes implementation easier. So um, I think for me, I would say the the key would be uh, making the process as competitive as possible um, to help you to uh, break through the bureaucracy that you can find in uh, in most systems. Thank you. Th thanks so much, uh, Pekwanja. Uh, there's um, also maybe a related question. You've touched on this a little bit, um, but maybe if you can just go to more, more depth. There's a question from Melvin, which is how do the general public get involved in, divine, in defining health benefits packages, particularly in Malawi? So can you say something uh, more about the, the MOH, civil, si civil society uh, inter interactions that, you, that you've done to SIC? Yeah, um, thank you again for that question. So um, involving the general public, of course, will be involved through the representation, I think mostly as you indicated from the civil society. So what we, we had a technical working group, uh, a functional technical working group that has representation from all these uh, uh, sec uh, sectors. So uh, the involvement of the, of the public came through the civil society who were involved in the decision making and we get we, we we I think as we were developing and um, and coming up with proposals for the both the health benefits package as well as the resource allocation formula, we tried to then engage them at each point at each major point and have them feedback into the process. Um, because um, if you if a civil society is uh, involved in the decision making, they can play a better role of informing the, the general public of what's happening. And, and can be a key advocate where they are very involved and they have been uh, they have assist us around the decisions that we are making. Thank you. Thank you, Pekwanja. Um, maybe a, a question for Edward um, uh, here. So it's a, a, an anonymous uh, question, but the the question is, uh, what role does health insurance policy uh, have, and can can uh, move towards social health insurance come in handy? Uh, for instance, in a country such as Nepal, um, where basic health facilities are still to be reached in um, in providing the circumstances through which uh, there's more likely to be a commitment towards a health benefits package. Uh, sorry, Paul, can, can you repeat the question? Because I haven't seen it here, so I need to understand it. Sure, sure. So I think do moves towards social health insurance help in uh, committing towards a health benefits package? Yes, uh, this is my personal view. I do believe that uh, the move towards a uh, social health insurance would help in committing to benefits packages. Because when you are talking about social health insurance or any insurance scheme, 
there's always a definition of the benefit package or the entitlements that the members of the scheme uh, will benefit from. And that's more like a benefit package because people have to know when they're enrolling that this is what we are going to benefit from and anything outside that we are not going to benefit as, a, as members of the, the insurance. So yes, I do believe that the move towards the insurance, social health insurance, would actually increase the commitment towards the benefit packages because this is a way of prioritizing the, the schemes so that they are, they are financially sustainable. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's still a number of questions. We're running towards the end of the hour. I'll, there's one question here from Watwe, which is, uh, when one designs a health benefits package, what is your take on costing uh, using normative uh, approaches? Um, I think this is kind of a bottom-up costing as opposed to uh, actual costs which are realised in delivery of interventions. Um, and maybe if I can respond to that uh, quickly. Costing is, is, is challenging. Uh, it's an imperfect uh, art in, 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 in many ways, particularly um, there's the opportunity to cost before interventions are rolled out, uh, but then uh, uh, retrospectively looking at the cost of implementation, there's not necessarily a right uh, answer to this. Both uh, ways have, have value uh, and can help in um, uh, affirming what likely costs are into, into the future. Sometimes cost of implementation may be less than would have been expected prior to intervention delivery because um, not everything that was anticipated actually has been, has been costed. Sometimes the costs in, in practice are, are, are greater. I think both approaches are, 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 are needed. And just to reiterate, it is an imperfect um, art or imperfect science. Um, so I think that gets us towards the end of the hour. For those questions we've been unable to uh, answer, we will offer a written response after, after the webinar. Um, so let me just move on to, on to the close of the session. Uh, firstly, let me thank Edward and Bakwanja uh, in particular and also to all of the audience for your questions. And once again, this lecture launches the Global Health Economics Hub of the Global Health Network, which is an open access community practice to support health economics capability building and its use, particularly within, within low and middle income countries. And we encourage you to please visit the website globalhealtheconomics.org um, to experience the website and please provide feedback to us on that. So a quick reminder that this lecture has been recorded so you will be able to find the lecture uh, and details about future lectures uh, on, on the Global Health Economics uh, website and the Global Health Network website. Um, and so to close today's lecture I'd like to thank once again speakers and also all of you for, for uh, attending, as well as the um, Global Health um, Network itself in, in hosting the community uh, and supporting the delivery of, of this webinar. So uh, thank you for your attendance and we'll, uh, we'll keep in touch. <laughs>